Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to be talking about the situation with global oil prices, particularly in the aftermath of the last week when prices for prices in the US market actually declined to negative. We have with us Prabir Purkar. Sir, Prabir, thank you for joining us. So first of all, could you explain what it means when prices go negative? So the number was around minus $37 or something. So what exactly does it mean? What it means is the person who is committed to taking delivery has no storage and therefore he has to give it to somebody who will take it off his hands. Right. Whoever was a supplier supplying the oil, normally if you don't take supplies, if you don't take his supply, then he might charge you a penalty. In this case, whoever is producing, say you've got to take it. You know, you are committed to it, you've got to take it. And then of course the trader was left, left holding that oil with no storage. And he had to pay somebody to take it off his hands. That's why the negative price. So it's, this is the real key issue right. that North America is rapidly running out of storage, particularly by the end of April, it's supposed to be that there is no going to be no storage. So anybody in May who doesn't have storage then cannot take the oil and is therefore the prices are not only could crash, but you even go to negative as we saw it did. Initially it was felt well, it is a May problem. And since everybody is now cutting his cloth according to whatever he needs. Therefore, this issue may not come up in June. But what we're seeing is that the June prices are also not looking good. They're at the 10 to $11. So all of this doesn't augur well for the oil market. So as far as producers are concerned, especially in the US, what real options are there? And there's also been some talk about the risks of what happens if you shut down production. So we'll talk a bit about that. Yeah, I think the longer term problem that the oil market has, particularly for North American producers, because a lot of the production comes from, as you know, shale oil or what's called tight oil. So whether it's the sands, which Canada has, which also you can produce oil from, or it is the shale oil. And today, United States produces almost 65%, 63, 65% of its oil from shale oil or what's called tight oil. So if that is so, then their prices have to be relatively high in order for it to, for them to make sense to produce. But the risk they carry is if they shut down a well completely, that means not just to reduce production, but shut it down. And that's true also for uh, other oil reservoirs which are there, for instance, in the Gulf, Saudi Arabian reserves and so on that if you shut off production completely, then you risk the whole uh, reserve that you have, and you may never be able to revive that oil field again. So this is the risk that shale oil suppliers, some of them, not all, and some of the those who have oil reserves were already, there is ingress of water and other things, they may have real problems of trying to shut down the wells, those wells completely. And reduction of production is one thing, shutting down uh, wells is a different issue. So I think there is a risk therefore of long-term damage to these oil companies, the who, those who hold those reserves. And therefore, this is not simply one of shutting off a tap. There are other consequences. And if they want to start again, there is again a huge amount of money they might have to reinvest in order to start those, start those wells. This is the critical issue that we have. And as we now know, some of the pipelines are saying, why don't you start, start using us as storage? Because piping of oil now is not going to be so important with lots of the, the stocks that were supposed to be delivered from the crude oil suppliers not being there. So they said, well, you could also consider pipelines as storage. But you know, this is all a short term solution. The real issue is that demand has collapsed and supply therefore has to fall in real terms. And if it doesn't, the price is going to collapse as well. Right. And a couple of other developments have been Trump, for instance, has speculated about imports from Saudi Arabia. He issued a threat to Iran the other day about US vessels being harassed. And some of this was seen as a response to the decline in prices also. So could you talk a bit about the uh, geostrategic aspects, especially in what's going to happen in West Asia and the US relationship to these countries in this situation? Well, I think Trump's threat to Iran was 
more in the nature of threat a day keeps Trump happy. And if he cannot find anybody to threaten that day, then he threatens the lungs of people with putting in disinfected bleach and so on into the lung of people to treat them for COVID-19. So we leave Trump out of it because he is a regular disturbance. It doesn't mean he's not dangerous, but if he's an unpredictable disturbance. So we leave that out of the picture. If we look at other issues, the Western oil producing, uh, shall we say, states, ge geographies have influential senators who have been threatening Saudi Arabia that will stop your oil from coming in, will do A, B, C, D, will stop stationing our troops and so on. So we'll stop probably also selling you arms, in which case, of course, the arms suppliers who are there in the United States will have a very serious problem. Right. But uh, leaving all of that out, essentially issue is threatening Saudi Arabia to keep oil prices high. But in a situation where demand has collapsed, lockdown means people are not using cars. People are not going to offices. People are not going for their holidays. So there is this whole issue the transportation system, which takes the bulk of the global oil, that they are not going to be in a position to do that. And this is not a short term, 15 days, 20 days issue. Exactly. This is a much longer term issue, which may go on for three to six or even 12 months. In which case, if you have a 12 months really collapse of demand of a significant kind, then obviously oil production has to be cut. And if oil production is not cut, then the oil prices will collapse because there is no storage. Right. So something has to happen. As I say, something has got to give. Right. So this is the first thing that we have to note. And oil production in the United States would have hit, as we know, more than 60% of their oil really comes from what's called tight oil or shale oil. So that's going to hit. Canada is going to be hit. There are also other producers like Venezuela who are already hit. But you asked me about West, Western West Asia, because that's today the biggest producer of oil, at least for the market, apart from Russia, which of course, as we know, is also a big producer. Russia has China to supply. Russia has its own internal demand. It has gas to supply to Western Europe. So that may not be that badly hit. But West Asia is going to be hit because where does its oil go? It goes to all over the world, including India, for instance. So that is going to be hit, particularly Saudi Arabia and countries like Bahrain who have calculated a fairly high uh, rate of oil mm -hmm. for their ba budget, balancing their budget. Saudi Arabia has calculated they're going to get $80 per barrel for their uh, oil. And that's how they have planned. So I think all these pl plans are going to be in deep trouble and they will have to redo all their arithmetic again. Right. How much they can do it is an open question, but certainly this is going to lead to a large dislocation, particularly for countries whose primary source of income has been oil. But countries like India, who have a large part of the NRI income coming from West Asia, would also be hit because a part, part of India's really income comes from that. But the countervailing issue is, of course, we'll be also buying less oil. Mm -hmm. So effectively, our import bill would also come down substantially. That has a tertiary effect on India's finances, government's finances, because a lot of it is really funded by the tax that Indian government puts on the consumption of oil in terms of the excise duties, customs duties, all of those duties that we put, means that ultimately, at the end of it, the consumers are charged a high price, and it's a tax on the, those who are using oil. So there are going to be cascading effects on exactly. the economies of different countries. But some total is West Asia is going to lose some ground. And the United States, who, which controlled the energy market of the world today, I think is going to see its control slip. And some part of it, the control, they'll have to share with Russia and China. China is the biggest consumer. Russia is a stable supplier who can live without the global market as long as it's a Chinese market and an internal market. Right. And finally, at the risk of doing some crystal ball gazing, do we also see some major changes in the way production and industrial activity itself happens because of this lockdown? Because as of now, we don't know if there are going to be second waves or third waves of infection. We don't know what sort of economic adjustments and how long these, some of these will have to be made. You see, I think 
we are going to see for at least three to future nine months, at least, if not 12 months, you are going to see a kind of lockdown, if you will, where a lot of people, even if various restrictions are physically lifted, they will reduce their going out, meeting people, going to bars, going to cinema halls, all of those social activities we take for granted is I think going to come down. Of course, economic activity still may start picking up because factories will start, production will start, but a whole bunch of things which depend on supplying to all of these activities, which are, as I said, things where people gather and there are social gatherings of different kinds. If that goes down, what happens? And obviously the hospitality industry would be hit, tourism would be hit, air traffic would be hit, and so would automobile industry, and of course consumption of petrol. So these are the areas where we are going to see a downturn. Certain activities would pick up, obviously online activities, distribution, using services like Amazon, in India, the huge number of them already. China has a huge number of them. So does the United States, as you know, takeaway services are very big in the US, in the food industry particularly. So all of these may still survive or do better, but certainly a section of the demand, a part of the demand is going to go, and that's going to lead to a longer economic crisis. It's not going to be a sharp drop and a sharp coming up, what is called the V-shaped recovery. That's not going to happen. What you're going to do, what you are already seeing, is a very steep cut. As people are saying, we are in the domain, essentially, of the 1929 crash. So we, have, we are seeing a deep, what I will call a deep cut in economic activities, steep fall in economic activities. But when it comes back, it's not going to come back so slowly, because as you said, this is going to have maybe a second wave, a third wave, or it would be a smoldering epidemic, which means a kind of self-regulation, if you will, or partial regulation by the government, depending on which part of the world you are in, will continue. Right. Thank you, Prabir, so much for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.